Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Jack Levin, and uh, I'm here to present uh, about a few things. Actually, I was traveling here on business, and uh, somebody said there is uh, this great conference going on, and you should stop stop by and do a talk. So I had literally about 12 hours to prepare uh, this presentation I wrote this morning. So uh, let's talk about you know things that we do. Uh, basically. Uh, currently, I work for a company called Inventify in Silicon Valley. And But before we get into what we do, I wanted to talk about the things I have done before. So in 1999 in Stanford, I, uh, I met uh, Sergey and Larry of Google, and I started to work at Google essentially in the very beginning when Google was pretty much a very, very small unknown company. And afterwards, uh, after six years or so, I started a company called ImageHack to do image to do image storage for for blogs, forums, and you know other online services. Afterwards, after ImageHack, I started Inventify, which is the company that does image optimization. So I wanted to briefly talk about how it was at Google initially, essentially my first week. So this server setup was my first project. Uh, in summer of 99, Larry Page said, hey, we have a lot of servers delivered in the data center. Why don't you go to the data center and <clears throat> connect a bunch of servers together and make sure they work well? So at the time, Google only had about 300 servers. There was no switches and no routers, pretty much no infrastructure of any kind. But things just somehow worked, which was pretty great. So that was my first project and I was there alone and uh, working in infrastructure team as you know a single person a few, few years later Google grew to quite quite a compute farm and that's what it become lots of servers hundreds of thousands of servers actually Google eventually came up with a uh, with a compute cloud that is now competing when, with uh, AWS or Amazon compute cloud so after working at Google for a while, I have decided to start my own thing. And in 2005, I started ImageHack. So some of you may have heard of ImageHack and used it. It's kind of like a, an image hosting site known for uh, its yellow frog, poisonous yellow frog. Uh, Germany happened to be one of the top countries that used ImageHack for image storage, which, which is very special. So. In Europe, uh, specifically, France, Germany, UK, Poland, uh, those were the top countries that used ImageHack. So ImageHack was essentially very similar to a company called Flickr, except Flickr did not allow any sort of image sharing. So image sharing uh, was uh, kind of an option for people who did not want to load images into specific sites. Like, for example, let's say you're building some sort of a website and you need to have image hosting. So what would you do? So there's few options. One option is to run your own server. So you start a server in your own data center, you load your images, and you become essentially a website designer as well as an IT uh, engineer that actually requires to run uh, all of your infrastructure yourself. Alternatively, you can go to AWS or Google Cloud and use their API to load your images. or you could use ImageHack, and ImageHack has a very simple UI, very simple interface. You, all, you load all of your images from your computer image library into ImageHack, and they become available for sharing anywhere. So for example, you could use Magento to start your web store, or you can use Shopify, and you can load images into ImageHack and use those images across all platforms. So whether it's Magento, Shopify, BigCommerce, or wherever. The key takeaway here is that rather than loading your images into some single uh, system, you can take those images, put, put it onto ImageHack, which is kind of like Switzerland, right? That's what we used to say to when we asked what ImageHack is all about. So we're kind of like this neutral territory where you can load your data and then share your data anywhere. So you can run multiple stores or multiple web stores using single source image. And you can also use uh, image check for other things, like for example, sharing images on Reddit or on forums or other blog posts or what have you. So, image check was a very interesting project, and at the at the top of it, at the top of its uh, popularity, we had close to 60 million unique users coming every month, which is a lot of traffic. 
Uh, that being the case, scaling beca became a really, really big issue. We had about maybe two to three million of, of images uploaded daily. Now, as you can imagine, images were coming in different sizes, different resolutions, and our goal was is to scale those images properly so that they can show up in a nice uh, formatted grid that you can use, that you can click on and navigate between uh, landing pages. So that became kind of like a scaling issue, and we worked for a few years trying to optimize images so that when people load images in, we can generate uh, different image sizes uh, as images come in. And that solution was very inefficient, very slow. It required a lot of servers, a lot of compute power, and a lot of management. Then in, a, in 2014, so fast forward a few years, uh, Pinterest, which is a very popular site that you probably know, came to prominence. So what Pinterest does, in a, in a nutshell, they allow you to create uh, what they call uh, image boards. And those images that are coming in as essentially links from websites and resources anywhere on the web. So you can, for example, if you find an interesting image, you grab its URL, give it to Pinterest, and P Pinterest kind of sucks it in and creates a board for you. Pinterest problem was very similar to ImageHack. They needed to represent images in different formats. For example, creating different galleries so that you can show those boards to your followers and your followers can consume those images and load those images quickly in different formats. So I happen to have had a friend who worked in Pinterest and he essentially sent me an email and said, hey Jack, uh, I know you're doing this for ImageHack, can you do this for Pinterest also? And myself and a group of engineers at ImageHack, we said, hey, why not? We could make it a, a project that could actually work as a B2B solution where other people could use it. In other words, scaling images on the fly uh, would work really well for Pinterest because, because they had even more images than ImageHack. So ImageHack maybe had a billion images uh, or so stored in, in an image library, but Pinterest had uh, dozens of billions of images and they had even more uh, image versions, so different size images were everywhere. So, again, what I wanted to talk about is, this, is the scalability. So this is a quadcopter, it's kind of fat and big and you can fly in it. So, seems to be like a simple problem, you just make things bigger. In reality, it's not so simple. <laughs> so, moving forward, I really wanted to talk about e-commerce and what we do for e-commerce today. As you know, e-commerce websites sell products, whatever the products are. Those products are usually visualized by images. So whether it's shoes or jeans or backpacks, whatever, those images must load quickly on any e-commerce site. If those images do not load, that means you will be losing your sales to your competition. E-commerce happens to be highly competitive space. Like for example, in US we have one of the two largest sites uh, or companies called Macy's and Nordstrom. They sell pretty much this very similar products. You can buy Nike shoes here or there. Your choice as a consumer could be Nordstrom or could be Macy's. Now, if Nordstrom does not load the shoes that you like, you click on the product and nothing loads, you have an option to go to Macy's. And after a while, if you have a poor experience at Nordstrom, you're just going to stop going to that site at all. So they're going to lose you as a consumer and Macy's going to win. So performance and optimization of uh, products that are shown on the website is highly important for e-commerce websites. Now. This is a very interesting infographic, and this is something that I learned years ago, but a lot of people don't know this. If you lose one second or one second delay on the web page, actually will cost you a lot of money. One second delay will cost you about 7% in, in loss of conversions. Now, conversion is something like, for example, you go to, to an e-commerce site and you choose your product, you, and you want to click on add to cart. Add to cart and then a purchase is conversion your website will lose 7% in conversions if you have one second delay. Now your web page already loads maybe three or four or five seconds per, per session. If you do not save on seconds, 
you actually end up losing money uh, and your revenue drops. And somebody, somebody else will sell that product instead of you. So what are the solutions to, uh, to loading pages quicker? Specifically, in light of uh, mobile devices coming online if, you know, uh, every day, there's more and more mobile consumers. Uh, mobile screens are changing all the time, so you need to be very, very quickly uh, adapting to different screen sizes so that you load uh, your images and your products and your web pages properly. So one of the solutions is, you probably have guessed it, the responsive design. So responsive design, basically, what it means is that you have different screen sizes and your website will adapt to, uh, with its layout to the screen size. Unfortunately, uh, and I have learned this uh, recently, 70% of desktop assets are served to mobile devices. What does it mean? That means that anytime you're building a blog or building an e-commerce site, it is very likely that two-thirds of all of your images are really meant for desktop, but they're being loaded into mobile devices. Now, what the mobile device does when it happens, it loads this image, this image is too large for its screen, it actually will throw away two-thirds of its information. So you just transmitted useless data, it will be thrown away by the phone anyway, and you have lost precious time uh, when it comes to performance. So I really like this sort of infographic, and I, I like it because uh, it was originally uh, spoken by Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee is kind of like my hero. Um, content is like water. So if you put water in a cup, it becomes the cup. If you put water in a bottle, it becomes the bottle. It's kind of, uh, I mean, you see cups and bottles and, and teacups right there, but then over there you, you see the mo mobile device and, and the desktop. So essentially, your content must form inside your screen, and it kind of makes sense. So product images, obviously, again, are very important. This is essentially where, where this is kind of like what Bruce Lee thought about. This is what we think about today. We think about websites and uh, essentially e-commerce pages loading well so that you can actually see the product that you want to buy. In many cases, if you do not adapt uh, your your desktop assets to to become responsive on mobile, you will end up loading a very big header, essentially explaining what what you're about to buy. But the product itself is going to be end up below the fold of the phone somewhere right here. So, what are the approaches to scaling images, and why images needs to be scaled? So, resp responsive images is. Uh, go hand in hand with responsive design. Responsive design the respon is is uh, sp specific to the web page scaling and layouts, but images can still be loaded the wrong way. Like for example, your layout changes, but then your assets are loaded with very fat and slow loading images. So how do we solve this problem? And there's few different approaches to image scaling and optimization. Let's say that you you have about only a thousand products that you're selling on, online. Now, a, th a thousand products that have, let's say, uh, at least five presentations. So in other words, uh, let's say it's a shoe or a backpack or whatever, and the pictures are taken from each side. Now, so a thousand becomes 5,000 files, and now you want to show those files in the, in the responsive manner through the responsive design where you have a, an image version for each device type. Specifically, uh, loading for mobile is different than loading for desktop. For, for, for desktop, your resolution could be as large as 2,000 pixels for your screen width. Now, for mobile, it could be something like 500 or 600 or even less, like 300. And of course, when we talk about thumbnails, those thumbnails need to be done even smaller. So there's two approaches, two general approaches. One is for small media library, static images. You just make image versions. You just basically say, here's my image library with 5,000 images. I'm going to make 10 different versions of each image. So you go from 5,000 to 50,000 files. Uh, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's really, in, in, in terms of comp you know, computing storage and, uh, and file storage, it's really not a lot. 50,000 files you can easily store on Amazon AWS S3, and it will cost you perhaps $10, $15 a month to store all those files. 
Now, if your image library and if your products do not change a lot, that's a fine solution. You don't need to do anything. It's very simple. You don't need to manage anything. You just need to make your files smaller, shrink them up, store them in different folders, and then serve them uh, with your responsive design on your, on your mobile version of your site. Very simple stuff. Now imagine you're a company that's rapidly growing. Like for example, um, About You, right? So About You is a very popular company here in Germany. A lot of people doing transactions online. So About You has a lot of uh, what they call articles. And articles are the items that they sell. Each item maybe has about uh, 10 presentations. And each presentation must be visualized in multitude uh, of different ways to fit the mobile screens, as well as uh, any brow browser of any size. Now, the solution there is no longer, so st static images is no longer becomes a, a good solution, simply because when you refresh uh, your image library, your media library, you may end up taking in a million files every quarter. Now, making uh, 15, 20 different versions of, of, a mil of 1 million files becomes somewhat of a difficult task because now you're producing dozens of millions of files. Not only that you need to store them, but it is the production process that is very cumbersome and hard to do. And it requires a lot of babysitting, a lot of engineering, and it's no longer as simple as when you only had 1,000 products. So in large enterprise e-commerce companies, this really becomes a big issue. So the solution is dynamic images. Now, what does it mean? So dynamic images is a situation where when your user comes into the website and your website identifies that user as a mobile user, the image is then converted automatically on the fly into proper formats. Now this solution has some benefits and it has some, uh, some cons as well. And here I'm actually outlining pros and cons. So with, you know, again, with the sta static image library uh, approach, it's very simple to start when you start when you start your kind of like e-commerce company or e-commerce presence online. Uh, the development effort is very low, and there's many open source tools that you can use. Like for example, Image Magic, or you can use Python or Ruby or anything. Uh, it's all available. Just type image uh, image scaling or image resizing in Google, and you can immediately uh, find tools to change things. Now, dynamic image library uh, pros are very simple. Uh, when the user comes, images just automatically become of proper size. Now the problems are somewhat more more complex because first of all is that you need to build that system first and there is no open source or any kind of sort of solution that's available. There's some Ruby plugin that plugs in image magic into Ruby and there's the Python uh, Tumblr project, but none of those projects actually scale. So in other words, you will end up running maybe 100 servers if your traffic is significant enough. And running 100 servers, running any sort of software is difficult, no matter how simple the software is. Just keeping a cluster running is not uh, a clear task. You actually need an engineering team, you need a logging team that actually looks at logs and uh, uh, has on call schedule and look, uh, does things like monitoring and fixes things and things are broken. Now, when you run 100 servers in a cluster, there's 100 things that can go wrong. Like for example, um, 10 of your servers may become slow and you wouldn't know that they're slow. So those 10 10% of their servers running in a cluster of 100 actually slowing everything down. You, you don't even know which ones. So the difficulty there is that you actually need to think like an operations engineer, but all you wanted to do is compress and resize images. So again, this becomes somewhat of, a, of an issue. Um, the dynamic image manipulation often does not scale. So whenever there is a, an impactful influx of traffic, like for example, what we call uh, in, in the States Cyber Monday, where everybody, every store, uh, every online store in the US actually drops prices by 30% or so. Everybody goes online and tries to buy, to buy things. So there, traffic almost doubles or triples or quadruples for some of the sites. The problem there is that if you're running dynamic, dynamic image resizing, it is difficult to scale to the influx of traffic because you cannot just say, hey, I have, I have 100 servers running on the farm, but now my traffic has tripled. I need to add 200 more servers to my cluster. It's actually somewhat difficult to do. Now, there's ways to do it. You can do it with AWS auto scaling, but again, 
out of scaling, even though it works, it's not an immediate solution. You do require some engineering effort to get it online. Um, so my team and I, we kind of looked uh, at the dynamic uh, image manipulation. We decided that this is the right thing for most of the people to do. The problem is the investment of time you need to spend to get that solution off the ground is significant. And all you really want to do is sell products online. Uh, sell products online, have uh, pr present great UI, great UX, great user experience. You really do not want to be spend, spending a million dollars or thousands of dollars in engineering, you know, thousands of engineering hours to build something that is not core to your business. Now, what's core to your business is m making sales and making users happy so that they can buy your products quickly. So what we decided to do is we decided to come up with, uh, with a cloud platform that you can turn on on your e-commerce sites, e-commerce website in five minutes or less. And we call it Imagizer Engine. Now, what Imagizer Engine does, uh, it actually works in, in different forms. First of all, you can go to imagizer.com, you can make an account right there, and you can point imagizer.com to your, your image storage. So your image storage could be Google Cloud or it could be S3 on AWS. Uh, you point Imagizer there, and then you have an API endpoint that allows you to manipulate images in real time. Now, Imagizer engine is written in C, and it's written essentially using very low-level libraries. So in other words, it's not PHP, it's not Python, it's not Ruby. It is extremely fast. It can manipulate images in real time under 50, 50 milliseconds or faster per image conversion. Now, the way that we approach dynamic image optimization. We actually not only give you the tools to change images on the fly by changing your URL parameters, we actually also run an analytics engine on top of Imagizer. Now what this analytics engine does is that it identifies the type of a user that you are. Like for example, you could be a user using desktop at home. Now this is like profile number one. You could be a user walking about in town using your Android phone. That's profile two. Profile three would be the same user, but your phone is, uh, is not an iPhone, but Android. Or you could be the same user now traveling on the train between Hamburg and Bremen, and the connection varies between being really good like an LTE or 4G, 3G, and eventually Edge. Now, what our system does, it actually measures your network performance as well the type of the device that you're using and then it serves images on the fly very quickly that are appropriate for your device and the connection type. Now you may be asking what is the difference between devices? Actually the difference is, is very important. So currently iPhone can load JPEGs. However, Android can load a f an image format called WebP. Now WebP format is very similar to PNG uh, but it has superior compression to PNG and it has much better loading time uh, overall just because the file is lighter. So we can detect that they're using an Android phone or if you're using a Chrome browser by looking at your user agent and automatically change those images to the proper format so that they load much quicker for your client or for you as a consumer. So now Imagizer is used by a few companies in the US, like Snapfish and Nordstrom and Imagecheck. There's also Vango and Uyala and Tantan. Tantan happens to be in Malaysia. And it is kind of like a Netflix clone, uh, but happens to be in Malaysia. The ease of deployment uh, is something that we really wanted to focus on. So the only thing that you really need to do is change your image source URL and point it to Imagizer. Now, this is something that you can run and do yourself. Uh, it's not really very difficult to learn how to do this. And I'm going to show some examples real quick. Now, this is Nordstrom. So Nordstrom right now, Nordstrom.com, uses Imagizer on Amazon AWS. They have about 50 million products that they're selling from their site. And each product has about 20 different variations of, uh, of each image. So scaling and fast image transformation was very important for Nordstrom and they're one of our clients. The other client is uh, Snapfish. So Snapfish is, uh, is very similar to a company here in Germany called CV, essentially a photo books for the printing company, where you can say, here's an image of a bag, 
but here's my image that I took uh, of a tree and, and a car, and I want to superimpose those images and, and show that image on, a, on an image gallery or an image landing page. Now, Imageizer, again, is very simple to start. There's, there's few variations that you can do. You can, you can use uh, a very simple model, essentially pay as you go per API query. So if you're a startup or you're building something or you have some sort of a project, it's literally, uh, you literally get charged for, uh, for your queries. So 1,000 queries, you, you pay a dollar. And if you do not use Imageizer today or tomorrow, you, you're not charged because you're not using anything. But anytime you use anything, then uh, your dollars and cents kind of accumulate. If you're a larger company, you can go to AWS Marketplace and launch Imageizer as a virtual machine directly from AWS. So if you have an S3 storage full of images, you have millions of images, you can launch an EC2, that's what AWS calls their virtual machine, and you can connect it to your S3 bucket and it becomes your infrastructure. Uh, your images don't go anywhere. They literally live in your own virtual cloud. That is, that is your personal cloud, and you can transform images right there at the source, which is very important. So uh, this is the team right now. Uh, there's four business people and uh, three engineers, and we have some consultants that are working on this project. And I have a few minutes left, so I really wanted to jump quickly into demos. So let's see if this works. One sec. And for that, I need the browser. All right, so first of all, um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Google, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to manipulate images using Imageizer. So google.com. How about I'm just going to type dogs. Now, I haven't done this query this morning, so this is completely organic demo. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to choose choose a picture uh, that is large enough that uh, we can dynamically manipulate. Well, how about this one? So here's an image of a dog right here. So I'm going to grab this URL. So the next thing that what I'm going to do, I'm going to type imageazure.com. And that's, by the way, how you can start using Imageizer. You just click register, then log in, and you can get uh, to use all the features here. What I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Sandbox. And Sandbox has all of the API features available. I'm going to paste this URL right here. Now, what happens behind the scenes is that Imageizer takes in the data. And uh, you can actually see if you can make this image uh, load faster or make it smaller. So like, for example, format, you can say, I really want to see how this image looks in WebP. So in WebP, the image, original image was 75 KB. Now it's 26 KB, which is very, 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 very good compression. Now notice that the image resolution have not changed at all. Uh, it stays the same, but all you have to do is essentially just turn on WebP right here. Or you can go to Auto, and Auto basically is a, is a format parameter here that will basically say, uh, Imageizer, please detect the browser type I am on and then serve the appropriate image format for me as a client or for your clients. Now let's go and do some image transformations. Uh, so what I want to do, I really want to make this image smaller. So let's go to about 500, 500 pixels right there. Now this look this dog looks adorable as in the rectangular picture, but what I really want to do, I want to make it into a square. So now it became a square. So if you're building an app or if you're building a store or a gallery and you need square images, you can build images that look square and uh, you can remove content around it. So you can literally format your viewport. And again, the original image is 75 KB, but the image here, because you have a lot lots less pixels, is only 13 KB. Now, I want to make sure that you guys can see that this is not some sort of JavaScript magic. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to delete uh, these parameters right here. So this is, the, this is the original picture. And changing the width of an image is as simple as this. So W equals 400, boom, image is resized. 
Now let's come up with some, some alternative resolution like 333. So you can see that image is rapidly changing its format. So it is real-time transformation. There's almost no delays of any kind. Of course, it makes sense to put the CDN on top of your image library so that you can, you can once images are converted, they're cached in the CDN so that they're pushed around the world and content becomes available closer to where the users are. Now, in case of, uh, in case of Nordstrom, uh, let's look, look at this real quick. So they have some advanced stuff uh, happening with their website. So let's look for things like uh, Nike. All right, so one of the biggest problems that Nordstrom have had is that their studios were producing uh, producing shoes that had too much white space. Now when I say too much white space, I don't know if you see this, you see how this, this rectangle right there has a lot of white now this image is fine for the desktop, but once you load it in your in your mobile browser, because of the white space, you, it takes pretty much all of your screen, and then the bottom, the bottom and the middle of the shoe is actually disappears behind the screen. You only see the the top right here. So that was one of their problems. So when they approached it, they said, "Hey, can you solve this problem for us using computer vision?" Now we asked them, "Well, why don't you just ask the studio to take pictures of your products properly?" And they said, "Well." They actually take millions and millions of pictures. We can't ask them to take even, you know, more millions of pictures of, of the products. It doesn't make any sense. So I said, fine. You know, certainly we can look at this uh, and see if we can manipulate images uh, using computer vision. So this image right here, you can actually see that uh, it's being manipulated to be seen uh, better. And if you look right here, Imageizer parameters are indicated. Uh, on the top, and of course, you can change the resolution. So I can say I really want to see a smaller image. Okay, let's change this to 400 by 400. So you can see it becomes nice, uh, uh, nice and square, and there's no extra extra white space at all. A regional image looks like this. So without the parameters that the, Im that the image as it applies, you can see that this image is actually has a lot of white space on top, which is fine for desktop, but not fine for mobile. So for mobile, they really wanted something like this. And you can easily do that uh, with Imageizer. So that's pretty much in it in a nutshell. I have about 10 or 15 minutes more. If anybody have any questions, I can do you know more demos, go over the API. Um, give you more examples, so on and so forth. By the way, the API is uh, page is right here. You can uh, pretty much go to docs.imageizer.com, look at the API, and see what you can do. So you can do things like face detection. You can remove uh, content from images that is not interesting. Like for example, this frog is really sitting on the left side of the tree. Right side of the tree is not interesting. It just have you know, wooden there, so you can apply uh, this parameter right here and your camera will move to where the frog is. And there are many other things that you can do right here. Like for example, you can say uh, this image has been taken, even though it's kind of like a fake image, but let's imagine it's been taken during the evening time and there was a lot of yellow. You can say auto level equals true and then there will be blue tones added to it. Now, again, this is useful for mobile apps. It's useful for, uh, for mobile websites in general. Uh, there are other things you can do. You can make images with brighter colors by adjusting sharpening. And again, the examples are right here. So you can essentially pass the URLs and make images more interesting. You can also do Instagram-like filters where you can say, I really want my image to be black and white. So if I were to go right here and load this, like so, and I'm going to say format, format equals 21. I know 21, uh, maybe it's not 21. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not changing color, but generally it's, it's supposed to turn black and white. And uh, the, way, the way that you can see this is um, there are options in uh, in the actual in the actual sandbox. So there's a few other things that you can do that are very interesting. You can do things like object recognition. Like for example, here's a camel and here's a car. So if I click on labels, 
uh, you can see animal, camel, mammal, buggy, carriage, vehicle, automobile in the car. Uh, so by pass passing on recognition equals labels, you can extract image content and sort your image content based on the on the kind of content that you can see. So this is a pretty cool, cool demo that I actually forgot to do. So let's uh, let's look at this real quick. So let's go back to go back to Google. Um, how about we we look for something natural like like river? Go to images and so here's here's some image right here. So I'm loading it up. And that website is very slow, it's not loading anything. How about this one? All right, there we go. So what I want to do is I want to paste it right here and I'm going to get rid of uh get rid of all the parameters. So I'm paste. And I think my my internet is gone. <laughs> Let's try this again. Okay, there we go. So if I click on labels, uh we can actually see that this is a creek, outdoors, water, rocks. Obviously, it's not it's not the sea, but the system thinks that there is a 60% chance that that being the sea. But 90% it's a river, which makes sense because this clearly is. And you can see, yes, you can basically say we may we might be guessing that uh, this is a river because there is a river in the file name. And I say fine, but uh, but what about the rock? Right. I mean, the system does recognize that there are rocks in there, and those are the rocks right here. So, uh, any questions? Yes. Orders of parameters does not play a role at all. You can set the parameters as you wish to be whatever they are. Questions, anybody, about fast loading images that you can uh, load very quickly into your mobile devices using by using Imagizer? I'm sorry, what kind of images? Retina images? Yes. Yeah, so uh, let's let's say that uh, let's say that you want very quickly to to change uh, Im image scaling. So there's an option called DPR. So whenever you detect uh, uh, your clients by using user agent, like for example, you know that people are coming from Mac Pro, MacBook Pro, you can say, let's not change the actual resolution, let's not compute the resolution, let's just change the DPR to be 2. Uh, now 2 in DPR basically means uh, multiply my width and height by 2. And you can set it to 3 as well. So whatever your original thumbnail is set, like let's say it's like something really small, just below 300, uh, your DPR will multiply will multiply those numbers by uh, by two essentially. So and you can you, you can use it right here. So if I go to three, you can see I just doubled the resolution. I can also go to four, and it becomes even larger. So essentially, it acts as a multiplier, and you can use that to to multiply your pixels. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you do not want your users to manipulate, there's there's two options that you can use. Option number one is that you can set up a proxy server that manages your policy as far as which ranges are available. You can literally say, "Here's my three resolutions I want. Everything else, do not accept." and send a, a 403 error or a 502, whatever you choose. That's one option. The second option, you can say, I really do not want to do anything or think of anything. I just want images to load properly from their viewports or, or image views from, from HTML. We have a system that can scan your web page, recognize how large your images should be, and then build a map that will automatically adjust image sizes based on the HTML codes itself. So you don't even need to use the parameters at all. Our system can scan your web pages and present images 
on as needed basis uh, for you, essentially. So no security is required because everything, the policy is driven by your web page image size. Yes. Can I upload gigantic uh, scientific uh, satellite images and it's still 1,000 uh, API requests or is there a difference between little thumbnails that get uploaded and really huge gigantic files? The accounting is basically the same in your... Uh, the, uh, when it comes to billing, billing is the same. Yeah. However, your performance may vary. Obviously, there's no magic in the world. The larger the file is, the slower it will be tra transmitted from your source to Imagizer. I mean, you cannot exceed the speed of light, right? No, of so course. there you go. So you will pay with performance. Yeah, but for scientific applications, it is a one-off job to... Yeah, that, uh, that, that would not be an issue. And uh, if you're doing stuff that's, uh, that's scientific, you can actually go to... Um, to AWS Marketplace, and from the Marketplace, you can uh, you can basically try running Imagizer. You can say like search for Imagizer right here, and you can launch um, servers of any size. Like you can say, I really want this gigantic server with 64 cores and it has unlimited bandwidth, and but you only will run it for an hour, so you will pay you will pay three dollars. Right, which is which is great because your task will be done within an hour, and then you shut it down, and you go back to whatever you originally were planning to do. So that's another way to run Imagizer in in pay-as-you-go model, where you're only charged for the number of hours that you use the system for. And you can find Imagizer on Amazon Marketplace by essentially typing Inventify or Imagizer, and you can launch your own virtual machine in your own cloud. Unfortunately, object recognition is only available uh, under under imagizer.com, so only here. So, and that's because we're using uh, neural networks that are actually running in our own data centers. So it wouldn't be available for you running locally in, in your cloud. Any more questions about fast images? Okay, well, let me ask you a question then. How many of you are carrying iPhones? Okay. And what about what about Android? I would say there's more people with iPhones. Well, the good the good news about iPhones is that Apple just came up with a new image format called uh, HEIC or HEIF. We're working um, uh, hard to actually allow uh, make that format available so just like webp for chrome uh heif will be available for imagizer so that images can become even more optimal for apple devices and safari will support it uh, as well i'm sure all right last question anybody okay thank you